morning, everyone, and welcome to the AIM 2020 Heartland Developers Conference. I am Tony Veland, Director of Community Engagement of AIM, and we are so glad you are here with us this morning. It is an honor to be here at the 17th Annual AIM HDC, surrounded virtually by an incredible group of tech professionals from across the Silicon Prairie. Before we officially kick off today's conference, we want to thank Microsoft for being our lead sponsor this year. It's been great to work with such an iconic global company with a long history in the tech sector. We also want to thank all of our wonderful sponsors. Without you, we couldn't bring together all of these amazing companies and the best software development talent in this region. We are very excited to have you here for the next few hours. HDC is an incredible opportunity to learn, share, and connect with other developers who are passionate about their craft. Together, we impact our communities every day, and we should be proud of that. Regardless of our background and experience, we all love using our creativity to build software and solve problems. Let's use this event to share our knowledge and ideas with one another today. As you attend a variety of breakout sessions throughout the day, take some time to stop into our virtual expo hall and do some one-on-one -on -one networking with your fellow attendees. If you are having technical problems, please message our Hopin platform rep on the chat. But first, I wanna say thank you for supporting the AIM Institute and our nonprofit mission of growing, connecting, and inspiring the tech talent community. AIM has impacted thousands of students, career changers, tech professionals, and leaders through our education, career development, and outreach programs. We have learned over the last 25 years that two things make the difference to build a strong tech talent community. First, investing in people with people. It's not just a website or a workshop that changes the trajectory of a person's life. What really takes someone on a whole new path toward a rewarding and productive career is human connection. We provide that through our mentoring, leadership development, and our educational programs, helping to build a more diverse tech talent community. And second, research from neuroscientists and educational professionals suggests that a fun learning experience is beneficial for long-term memory. In other words, it's gotta be fun. It can't not be fun. And we do that here at AIM through our outreach programs and code school. And we're gonna have fun today here at HDC. What adds to this successful formula is the addition of interesting, unique, challenging, immersive tech education experiences that equip youth with what we'd like to call creative confidence, the confidence to try, explore, think, and solve. The AIM Institute is a nonprofit that builds the tech talent community from teaching kids beginning at the age of seven about tech experiences in coding to helping people convert to a career in tech through the AIM Code School to hosting inspirational events for tech professionals like HDC and Tech Celebration, we are here for every stage of a person's growth in technology. Being a nonprofit, we have an amazing group of dedicated board members. Their leadership insights and undying support continually help the AIM Institute to evolve and provide powerful programs to create the community we all want for the future that we need. Thank you to all of our board members for all their support. Now you'll get a chance to learn, and you'll also get a chance to connect, but you'll also get a chance to win today. There will be two raffles throughout the day. If you make a donation of any size to the AIM Institute before 4 p.m., you will be entered to win a pair of wireless, Bluetooth, noise-canceling headphones worth $300. And if you visit all of our booths in the virtual expo hall, you will be entered into a raffle to win a Lenovo Duet 2-in-1 Chromebook. Both winners will be announced on the main stage at the end of the day. Thank you in advance for your support of the AIM Institute and our mission to get more people into tech careers. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our keynote, Jessica Dean. Hi, my name is Jessica Dean, and I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. I'm super excited to be here today to talk about DevOps, waffles, and superheroes. Oh my. Now, before we dive right in, because sadly we only have about 40 minutes together, I want to do a brief overview of what it is that you can expect from this session. First, the session was not designed to make anyone an expert, right? 
This session was designed instead to get you thinking, to show you some things that are possible that you might not be aware of, to get you excited, and then to get you amped up to go out and learn more on your own after the session's over. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly is DevOps, right? This is a DevOps talk. We've mentioned waffles. We've mentioned superheroes. Let's start from the beginning. What is DevOps? And this de definition of DevOps is the same definition that all of us at Microsoft stand behind. There's little Dono Dude or Donovan Brown in the bottom right-hand corner there. And he spent 30 days writing this definition so that him, all of us on the DevOps team, and all of us at Microsoft could stand behind every single word in this definition. DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. Continuous delivery of value. The most important word on this slide is value. Because if we're not delivering value, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And more importantly, how do we know if we're delivering value, right? How do we gauge that? How do we have insights? Do we have metrics? Do we have telemetry? Especially in a world full of distributed systems and abstraction and microservices, seeing that value and ensuring that we're delivering that value becomes quite challenging. So we're going to focus on how we can do that today. Now, we also want to touch on why DevOps really connects to containers. And as we'll learn or come to learn today, why it really connects to waffles. And you'll, you'll see why very shortly here. But why do we care about containers? We've all heard the age old saying of it works on my machine, right? Maybe those of us who are developers, we've said that it works on my machine. It's your server. It's your problem. Give me the keys to the castle. I'll go over and beat it with a hammer and I'm going to make it work on the server, right? Well, containers actually makes that even easier because it sets up this right once run anywhere application architecture for the developer. It actually sets up a foundation that makes microservice architecture possible. And then for the operations people, which by the way, I spent over 10 years as a systems administrator prior to joining Microsoft, so I can relate to that operations side as well. For the operations people, we're able to now have portability. We're able to have standardization across our environments, dev, test, QA, canary, prod. Now that container is going to work no matter where I put it. I have abstraction, which makes it easier both from an operations perspective to troubleshoot and manage and from a developer perspective to sit there and kind of break out that abstraction or that microservice uh, application architecture compared to a monolith. I'm able to have higher compute density. I can take advantage of my compute power that much more and I can scale significantly easier. So this is one of the reasons how come we talk about containers a lot when it comes into conversations of DevOps. Now this is a superheroes talk. So in case you happen to have been snapped by Thanos' fingers for the past five years and you're just now getting into this and you're trying to understand what all this stuff is, I am so happy you're here. You might be wondering what exactly is Kubernetes? I've heard a lot of people talking about it. Kind of get it, kind of don't. Okay, this definition is for you. Kubernetes is an open source container orchestrator that was designed to automate deployment, scaling, and management of applications. So what does that exactly mean? It means that Kubernetes was designed to simplify automation, to simplify the way that we deliver our applications, okay? The way that we manage our applications, the way that we distribute our applications. Now, let's go ahead and review how Kubernetes makes this possible, how the architecture actually works. In the instance that you're not having a cloud provider manage your Kubernetes cluster or your Kubernetes environment, you're gonna have something called your control plane. This is going to have your main nodes. You can have one or three typically is how it's configured. And those main nodes or your control plane is going to hold things like your API server, your etcd, your scheduler, your controller manager, your cloud controller. And that control plane then communicates with your agent pool or your worker nodes. And that's where your pods and your containers are actually running scheduled and distributed equally as however you define it across that agent pool. And you're able to define this or deploy this through that Kubernetes API endpoint. Now, you as the user, whether you're a developer or operations or DevOps engineer, whatever you are, you're probably defining that deployment or the way of the world you want it to be. You're kind of like Thanos in that. You get to snap your fingers and you send off that workload definition. 
either an adjacent file, a YAML file, a Helm chart package. You send that over to the Kubernetes API endpoint, and then that control plane takes it and distributes it across to your agent pool. Now, this looks actually pretty complicated, right? There's a lot of moving parts here to manage. So in a cloud world, you'll usually have a cloud provider come in that will manage your control plane for you, which now frees up your time and enables you to only focus on that workload definition or how many snaps you want to make to hand that over to the Kubernetes API endpoint and distribute your applications accordingly to your agent pool. Okay, this is one of the reasons to come managed services or managed Kubernetes clusters have become so popular. I also mentioned the word, word Helm. And in case you're not familiar with what Helm is, again, I'm so glad you asked. Helm is the de facto Kubernetes package manager. You can think of it like NuGet, PIP, or apt. It's powered by a template engine, and it makes it a lot easier to manage all the moving parts or all the definitions that you need for your application. Be it that you have a service or an ingress or a deployment, a pod, you have multiple containers that run in a pod. You can now manage this a lot easier because of templates that are pre-provisioned. You only have to worry about really updating one file and you can link your packages together the same way you could in any other package kind of system, right? So Helm is almost as old as Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has been around for, I believe, just about a little over six years. And Helm came around about a year after Kubernetes came out. It was designed because Kubernetes was hard. As much as Kubernetes was trying to simplify automation, Helm came out to simplify the simplify. Okay. Now we've talked about Kubernetes. We've talked about Helm. Let's actually kind of put some of these things to kind of like give a face to the name kind of thing. Let's get familiar with it and let's learn maybe how we can interact with this using something like Visual Studio Code and some extensions to make things like Docker and Helm and Kubernetes a little bit easier. Let's check out this demo. So I'm currently in Visual Studio Code and let's just take a look at a Docker file. You can see that I have lines here that says from. In fact, I have from on line six, I have from on line 14 right here, and I have from again on line 24. This is what's called a multi-stage Docker build because a lot of times what you need at build is not what you need at actual runtime. So this first block of code, 6212, is actually building the React component of this Tailwind Traders application that we'll use throughout today's session. This next block of code, lines 14 through 22, is building the .NET Core component of this application. It's a hybrid front-end application, .NET Core and React. And then we're copying the output from those two stages over into this final stage where we're only using the runtime for .NET Core to actually run our web front end. Now, the cool thing is, is we can integrate right very easily within VS Code by using the terminal. And we could just do something like Docker build. And I had previously built this, so this would build really fast. We could also do the command palette and search for Docker, and we could see that we have some Docker commands. Now, these commands are brought to us because we have the extension marketplace. So you can see right here, if I search for Docker, here's my Docker extension. I can search for Kubernetes, and I have an Azure Kubernetes extension. This is also another really helpful extension when you're working with Kubernetes. Uh, you can also see I have a local process with Kubernetes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we also have perhaps one of my favorites. We have the Azure, uh, let's see, I would have to do at installed and then do Azure. I have the Azure account uh, extension as well. Now you can see on the left hand side here, here's where I have access to my Kubernetes clusters. I have a local Docker Kubernetes setup. I have Azure Kubernetes service. If we go back over to our files, we can also take a look at our Helm charts just so we kind of get some familiarity with what exactly Helm is. So we can drop down into web and you can see I have a templates directory and a values file. Let's just click on this values file here. And you'll notice we have image, repository. Some of these have indents, right? Two, tab, two spaces or one tab. And if we drop down on one of the templates and we click on deployment, you'll notice that there's a lot of references to values. That's because this is referencing that values file. So as opposed to having to manage multiple YAMLs files, that's one of the benefits of Helm as a package manager. It's simply a template engine that's going to then parse in the values that you specify accordingly right here in your all up knobs and dials. All right, 
So I hope that we learned a little bit there, right? I know it was kind of a quick demo, but we were able to really see how that structure of Helm charts work. We were able to get familiar with some Docker files. We were able to kind of see how these pieces start putting together and even see some extensions that we can use. Now, you might still be a little unsure of what exactly is a container. I understand that there's this thing called a Docker file and it seems to have different commands and things in it. But what actually is a container? A container is not a real thing and it's not a virtual machine, despite how many people will say a container is kind of like a virtual machine. No, it's not. And you're, you're going to slowly come to figure out why. We'll talk about virtualization and containers in just a moment. Containers in and of itself is just an application delivery mechanism. Its only goal is to deliver your application, to deliver that value to your end users. It's based on several key Linux kernel features. So you'll hear words like C groups or namespaces. C groups is what a process can use. That's things like your CPU and your memory. Namespaces is what a process can see. So this is really helpful if you have multiple microservices or multiple processes that have to interact with each other, you're probably going to want to put them in the same namespace so they can all communicate with each other. Okay. Now, an easier and more delicious way to think of what a container is, is to compare it to a waffle. And here's why. How many of you enjoy eating waffles completely plain? No butter, no syrup. Picture on the screen is a little bit mislead misleading. All you want on it is just the waffle itself. And I'm sure there's one of you, and that's great. But if you're anything like me, I want everything. I want all the value, all the happiness piled right on top of that waffle, maybe even baked inside of it with some chocolate chips. I want strawberries. I want whipped cream. I want blueberries, pecans, maple syrup. I want the whole nine yards. And that waffle now, or that bread, has become a delivery mechanism for all the other sugary, happy, value-added goodness to my life and to my stomach. That waffle is just delivering the extra value to me and it's making it more of an enjoyable experience from the end user perspective. That's all a container is doing is whatever you put in your container is just delivering that value to our end users and to our customers. And we deliver that value or we tell what toppings we want to add by using a Docker file. The Docker file is kind of like the RTFM for your application. You define the steps that you need for your application to run, for the environment to be set up. You have a base image. In this instance, we're going to deploy a Python application. So I use Python as my base. I set a work directory in my container, in my application. This is very, very simple. It can just be slash app. And then I copy the files from my application itself over into this container. And this happens through the Docker build process. We'll learn about that on the next slide. From there, I run the command that I would run normally on my local system if I were not working with containers. That's just pip install, and then I give it a requirements file. I expose the port that's needed for my application, port 8000 in this case. I can pass in any environment variables that I want. And in this instance, I have greeting in my application, so I'm going to pass in the words hello world directly defined in this container. And then finally, I run the application the same way I run it locally with Python app.py. Now, I mentioned that we're going to talk about how all of this comes together in the Docker build process. And this is important because this is where we start considering what we're baking into our waffle, right? What we're adding into that value delivery mechanism, okay? Docker build, the command, is going to build the image according to the steps that we just defined. And it's going to use what's called your Docker context. That's the set of files in the specified path or URL. That's whatever you specify with the Docker build command. So I'm going to show you three examples. The first example, I'm in my home directory. I'm in a Tailwind Traders website folder. I can run the command docker build source Tailwind Traders web. I can use dash T to tack my image. That's what I'm going to want to name it. I want TWT container. And then I use colon one to specify whatever version. This is version one of my Tailwind Traders application. What is highlighted, what is in yellow, is the actual context. That's where the files for everything lives. That's where my instructions or my Docker file lives, as well as all the files needed for the application itself. This is the same command as something a little bit more verbose, where now I'm using Docker build dash F for the file. Which set of instructions file do I want to use? This is helpful if maybe I have a different Docker file because we're moving from .NET 2.1 to .NET 3.0, and now I have a different Docker file, different set of instructions, 
as well as a different path or context of where those files live. Okay, what's highlighted again is where I'm starting to set up that context and that path of where I want the Docker build engine to go look for my application. Or I can get even further and I can change directories into Tailwind Traders Web, drop down into source, drop down into Tailwind Traders Web, and now we could do Docker build period. That period is my PWD. That's the local path that I've now dropped down into or changed directory into. And I can still use dash F to specify whichever Docker file I want to use. Either my standard basic Docker file that maybe supports .NET 2.1 or 2.2, or I can use dockerfile.develop, dockerfile.upgrade, dockerfile.test. I have complete control over it. All three of these commands are gonna do the same thing. It's the matter in which I use it, right? Stanley, with great power comes great responsibility. I get to be responsible with how I want to deploy this application and how I want to structure that command. Now, I mentioned we were going to talk about the differences between virtualization and containerization and why a container is not really anything like a virtual machine. Virtualization has two types. You either have a hypervisor that sits on, directly on top of your host operating system or your hypervisor sits directly on top of bare metal. But in either scenario, you're gonna have an independent guest operating system with independent sets of dependencies, application binaries, and independent applications. Virtual machine A is gonna differ from virtual machine B and C, and virtual machine B and C is gonna differ from A, B, C, right? They're, they're all their own independent virtual machine. However, in containers, that's different. Okay, it's also significantly smaller because it's just one uh, kernel. It's, it's just one smaller version of what you need for your application to run. You still have a host operating system that sits directly on top of your infrastructure, but then you have a container runtime that runs as part of your host operating system. In this instance, we're using Docker. So Docker is going to support my Docker container. My Docker container is only going to have what it needs to run the application. That might be Python, that might be .NET, that might be Go. It's gonna have any dependencies packaged right alongside it and the application itself. So I go from a virtual machine that might be sometimes 20 gigabytes down to a container image that can be as small as five megabytes, right? It makes it a lot stronger from a performance perspective. It makes it immutable, it makes it portable. There's so many benefits that come along with having containers. Now we've talked a little bit about cakes, about waffles. Actually, we've talked about waffles. We're gonna talk about cakes right now. We really wanna consider what we're putting into the layers of that value delivery mechanism, okay? Anything that we define in our steps in our Docker file, anything that we write on each line is going to be part of our image. It's gonna be read only. We're now baking that into our cake. That could be chocolate chips, or it could be an SSH key pair. That could be blueberries that maybe we're putting in, or it could be a database connection string with a password in plain text. Anything that we put into our cake or into our waffle, into that image layer that we're now building, that's gonna be accessible at the container layer at read write. So we really wanna make sure that we're not putting anything in there that's not gonna deliver value, that's actually going to hinder our value delivery intention. We've touched on a lot of this, but I want to make sure we highlight here are some key benefits of using containers. First off, it goes without saying that now containers enable me from a DevOps perspective to have something that's repeatable. I have something that's reliable. The same way I build and deploy on my system is going to work in dev, QA, production, canary, staging, test. It doesn't matter. It's going to work the same on my system, on your system. Now it's something that's repeatable. We also briefly touched on this, but now I have a faster startup time. Because it's a smaller image, I now have something that can perform better. It also has a smaller attack surface, which means that so long as I'm considering what I'm putting in those layers, it can be more secure. Okay, so now from a vulnerability or security perspective, I'm also considering how I can deliver value from that perspective as well. We did kind of hammer this uh, into the ground at this point, right, using Thor's hammer, but I package my dependencies right alongside my application. So my application already has everything it needs and it doesn't have anything that it doesn't. And then finally, containers run absolutely everywhere. I can build the container on my Mac, run it on your Windows, run it in my cloud, in your cloud, on IoT devices, Raspberry Pi. It's kind of like Oprah. 
you get a container, you get a container, you get a container, and all of the containers work. It's absolutely fantastic. Okay. So we've really kind of been on a journey, but I want to wrap up with one more awesome demo that really kind of explains how we can ensure that we're delivering that value, even in an abstracted world full of distributed systems. There's something called bridge to Kubernetes. You saw me show the local process Kubernetes uh, extension in the first demo. This is this bridge to Kubernetes that's going to enable me as a developer to really develop and test uh, a lot quicker and a lot more independently when it comes to maybe trying to troubleshoot one API in the context of a larger application. This is gonna also help me have confidence in whatever my changes are when I make a pull request and push it over so that we can get an update pushed out into production. Let's take our Tailwind Traders application. We could have you or me accessing the application and I'm gonna end up hitting a web front end that's .NET Core and React based. That's going to route me to a backend front end where I have access to all my individual and decoupled APIs. That's things like my coupons API, my stock API, my products, my cart, my popular products profile. All those APIs communicate with other databases, Cosmos DB, SQL Server DB. And we recently identified that there's a problem in the cart API. In fact, and I'm, I'm one of the developers that worked on the cart API. So I have the cart API code open on my system. I'm going to be able to take the code from my system and I need to troubleshoot this one API in the context of this larger application. So I can actually take that code and route traffic over into my Kubernetes cluster. I can do this in an isolated sandbox without needing help from any other person. I can test and have confidence in what I'm going to fix on my own. It's going to route traffic to where I still have access to coupons, stock, web front end, back end, everything, but I'll be able to just have that isolated environment for this one broken API. Okay, let's take a look and let's see how we can really gain confidence when it comes to Kubernetes, when it comes to DevOps, and most importantly, when it comes to delivering value. So I'm currently working within the CART API and I'm using the local process for Kubernetes extension, which allows me to debug on my local system without needing to worry about Docker and Helm charts. So let's go ahead and check it out. First thing, uh, we can drop down and you can see I have a shopping cart model right here that we're going to be working with. Let's take a look at the problem. I'm going to go ahead and click on the little Kubernetes down here at the bottom. And I'm just going to choose to route over to my ingress controller. We're going to go drop something into our cart. Uh, you can see that I've already tried this a few times. We'll just drop this wooden table into the cart. We'll simply click on the cart. And it seems that every time I try to shop, I get a garden gnome at it. So let's see if we can debug this without having to work, worry about Docker and Helm charts. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my same local debugger, my launch program, which would just launch this particular API locally on port 3000. Only instead, I'm going to launch it with Kubernetes and I'm going to do so isolated. So what that means is once this starts up, it's going to redirect the service traffic, but it's going to isolate that service with my own prefix. So I'll be able to start working and debugging this in my own specialized environment in my own fully qualified domain name that's not gonna interrupt any traffic on the actual root domain name. All right, so you can see this line right here, it says the container port 3001, which is actually what we're exposing in our Docker file. And you can see that right here in Docker file, we're setting an environment for port and then we're exposing that that's now available at localhost 3000. So now that that's available, let's go ahead and click on shopping cart. And you can see I have an initial sync call. I'm finding email. I'm starting to query the Cosmos DB that we have in our application stack. And I have right here on line 51, an add item call or function that's actually, again, when I'm adding an item to my cart. So I'm just gonna set a breakpoint right here on line 53. I'm going to click Kubernetes down here at the bottom, and you'll notice I have now my new isolated fully qualified domain name with a prefix of Jessica D and some random numbers. I'm going to click that, and that's going to take me to my very own URL right here, right? We can see Jessica Dean 7091, and then this was the actual root domain. So this is going to be my own uh, environment where I can start to see what's happening here, and I can actually hit a breakpoint. So I'm just going to add this microwave. 
And just like that, I hit my breakpoint, you can see right here. And now I can hover over this and I can actually see the detail of what's being sent. You can see here's the detailed product. Sure enough, it's sending a single red garden gnome. Now let's go over to our debugger and see the call stack. You can see the add item is part of it, process ticket, and then there's another add product, which is actually a different file. Now this appears to reference this shopping cart add item right here. If I scroll up a little more, I see the actual add product, and I see that I'm also supposed to have requests, and it looks like myself or another developer had actually hard-coded a body call to test something, and unfortunately that got pushed into production. I don't know why we were choosing a red garden gnome, but I think we were checking to make sure that this function was working. So rather than having item equal to body, I want it equal to the request, to the body request. So I'm gonna save, and just to be safe, I'm also gonna comment out this other const, and we're gonna go ahead and save that. Now I will restart the debugger, and we'll close this car controller. Let's go and double check. We'll leave our breaking point right now on our return. Let's head back on over here, we'll refresh, and we'll retry to add that item to our cart. And I want—I left the breakpoint because I wanna see what the actual call stack is. So we hover over this now, and if we click on our detailed product and drop down, I now can see that microwave is actually being sent, right? So it looks as though we've resolved that. I can click continue and see what happens. See, it looks like microwave has now been added. Let's go take a look at our shopping cart. And it looks like now we're finally seeing our microwave. We'll go ahead and clean this up. We'll clear out all our garden gnomes and our microwave. We'll do it one more time. There we go. Now I'll remove this breaking point here. Okay, we'll remove, go ahead and refresh, head back over to kitchen accessories, go back to coffee maker, click add to cart. And there we go. Now I see coffee maker red has been added to cart. So I'm fairly confident in all this, but how do I have my same team have the same level of confidence? And this is something that's really cool. The same functionality that is built into VS Code is actually part of just Kubernetes on Azure. So for example, if I check this into a special branch, I'm on Jessica Gnome Fix, and I'm just gonna say Gnome Bug Fix, and I'm gonna go ahead and commit, and I'm gonna push we can head on over to GitHub and there's actually a PR workflow that will start once we open a pull request. So I'm just gonna click open pull request. We'll make sure I'll move it into my repository. So I'll go from my GNOME fix over into my main repository. I'll create that pull request and a workflow will fire off. Now the cool thing is, is what happens when that workflow fires off. Not only do I have an isolated environment, but there will actually be an isolated environment set up for this pull request. So everyone now on the team, whether they're a designer, whether they're a developer, whether they're operations, whether they speak code or whether they don't speak code, will still have the same level of confidence. You can see right here as it's starting to go through the build setup, it'll do a bunch of different things. It'll do Docker, it'll actually install via Helm, it'll set up routing labels, it'll handle everything as per this extension. And once it completes, we'll see our bot comment right here. There we go, you can see that the private version has been added. And if we zoom in here real quick, you'll see that now my prefix is actually equal to the name of my branch. So everyone gets the same level of confidence that I get from my local VS Code experience. All right. That's probably one of my favorite demos to give just because it's so awesome. It really is setting us up for being able to focus more on the application and focus more on that end user experience. Now I wanna wrap up with a quote from Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Gemma Simmons. The steps you take don't have to be big. They just have to lead you in the right direction. We've been on a journey, right? We've talked about Docker, we've talked about Helm, we've talked about Kubernetes, we've talked about how to debug abstracted services. Not every application and not every workload is going to need Kubernetes, is going to need all of these steps. All we have to do is remember that that end goal, that goal that we're now incentivized, whether we're developers or operations, is to deliver value. As long as we're taking small steps towards that value delivery of continuously being able to deliver that value, repeatedly, reliably, and confidently deliver that value to our end users. We're moving in the right direction. They don't have to be big. It doesn't have to be multi-cloud, Kubernetes, all this robust stuff. 
It just has to be that focus on that value, delivery, and intention. You can ask yourself, is this adding value? Or does this add unnecessary complexity? I've been guilty of this myself, right? One of the hardest things we'll learn as developers or operations engineers is not how to type code, but how to delete code or delete dependencies that we no longer need because it's adding unnecessary complexity and it is not actually adding that value that we're seeking for. At the end of the day, we really have to remember that all of this that we're trying to do is really just a waffle. It's just that delivery mechanism to deliver happiness, deliver value, rinse and repeat. Now, I want to finally end everything with some Kubernetes best practices just so that we can make sure that we're remembering how we can accomplish everything we discussed today. First, we really want to try to build small containers. The smaller our containers are, the smaller the attack surface, the less likely we're baking something into our cake or our waffle or our layers that we don't want to bake in. Something like a secure secret or a personal access token, SSH key pair, plain text password, you name it, I've seen it. We also want to consider our application architecture. Use namespaces. We can organize things into namespaces, and then we can even take advantage of different network policies and, and other projects that we can use to make sure that we're locking down the security of our application and our microservices even further. We can use Helm charts. In fact, that is a best practice because it's one of the easiest ways to manage our applications, to be able to roll back and see our application as we define it right alongside our code because I can check both of them into source control together. We also wanna make sure that we're using our role-based access control. And we're not just giving godlike permissions to everything when our applications or the engineers on our team don't actually need that level of permissions. We also wanna be sure to implement health checks. This is things where we can set things like liveness and readiness probes to make sure that our application is alive and that we don't have any kind of hanging or memory dump errors. One of, another big thing is to set resource requests and limits. This is kind of where we go back to C groups being uh, what a process can use, things like your CPU and memory. We wanna make sure that we're only allocating the CPU and memory to our process that our process needs. If our application doesn't need one gigabyte worth of CPU or memory, then we wanna make sure that we set that limit. We set the max ceiling that our application can use. And then finally, we wanna be mindful of our services. As we've discussed, not everything needs to run in Kubernetes. You can run your databases in managed database services. You might have a reason for why, why you wanna run it in a Kubernetes cluster. But in any scenario, I challenge you to consider and ask yourself if this is unnecessary, if this is adding additional complexity, and if you can free up your time by mapping external services, I encourage you to do so. Finally, don't rely on load balancers for everything. Sure, there's a time that load balancers are important, but there's other things that you can utilize. You can utilize application gateways, Nginx proxies. You don't have to have everything with a load balancer in an IP address backed. It's expensive, both from a time management and cost management perspective. And finally, have fun with it. We're all just in this thing called life and technology, and we're all just learning every day. And speaking of learning, I promised you resources where you can go and learn more. Where is it that you go to learn skills or upskill normally? Chances are you go to YouTube or you go to Google or Bing or your favorite search engine, whatever it is. Well, now you can go to learn.microsoft.com. And if you've ever wanted to learn about anything Azure, take functions, you can go search for that and you'll see different modules that'll pop up. Modules then get grouped into learning paths and learning paths is how you can sit there and say, I want to become a Kubernetes expert. I wanna become a functions expert. I wanna become a DevOps expert. And you can take individual modules that ultimately take you on this learning path journey. We even walk you through how to do basic things like create an Azure account or maybe more complicated things like getting started with Kubernetes. And everything is walked through by holding your hand. We'll create a sandbox accounts for you. We'll walk you through the different commands you have to use to get started. You can search for, like I said, anything. If we take DevOps, for example, you can find Azure fundamentals. If before you get started with DevOps or Azure DevOps, you wanna actually understand what exactly cloud computing is and, and how all this Azure stuff fits together, all of that, 
is available for free on learn.microsoft.com. We can start searching for the different learning paths that are available. If you want to become a DevOps expert or Azure 365 fundamentals or power apps, we have learning paths and modules for absolutely everything. Here's one where we're searching for containers. We're searching for serverless, right? And we can see the different learning paths. And then in the learning paths, we see the modules that we were looking at just a few moments ago. Learn.microsoft.com is incredibly powerful. And sometimes I honestly still can't believe that it's free. Now, personal story for me is this is how even I've upskilled a lot of things that I've tried to learn recently. If I wanted to get started with a web app in Azure and tie serverless in, I don't even have to have my own Azure account. I can actually click start or create my sandbox environment and learn.microsoft.com goes out and creates all that stuff for me. Again, I don't have to do anything. It's completely free and it'll walk me through in an isolated environment how I can set up my resource group and my location and anything else that I'm interested in setting up or that's needed for this particular module for this particular lesson. It's awesome. It's probably one of the best ways to get hands-on experience when it comes to learning a new skill. And again, superheroes, maybe more of a video game reference, but we're all just looking to level up, right? So might as well have some fun while doing it. You can feel free to reach out to me anytime. My name is Jessica Deem, and I'm here because I love technology and community. As you can tell, I focus heavily on Linux, open source software, DevOps, containers. I'm a huge fan of Disney and Marvel. If you follow me online, I'll often post about fitness as well. There's no relation to James Dean, and I put that in there because of the spelling of my last name. My last name has two E's. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and GitHub. I'd love to connect with you. Finally, thank you very much. It has been my absolute pleasure to hang out with you today.
Now you'll get a chance to learn, and you'll also get a chance to connect, but you'll also get a chance to win today. There will be two raffles throughout the day. If you make a donation of any size to the AIM Institute before 4 p.m., you will be entered to win a pair of wireless, Bluetooth, noise-canceling headphones worth $300. And if you visit all of our booths in the virtual expo hall, you will be entered into a raffle to win a Lenovo Duet 2-in-1 Chromebook. Both winners will be announced on the main stage at the end of the day. Thank you in advance for your support of the AIM Institute and our mission to get more people into tech careers. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our keynote, Jessica Dean.